So let's talk cosmological argument. All right. You know something about that, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, what is the history of that argument? How far back does it go? Oh, it really extends very far back um, toward the very beginning of Christianity, actually. Um, early Christian commentators disputed the Greek doctrine of the eternity of matter. According to Aristotle, uh, the universe has always existed, and the role of God is simply to provide order in the eternal cosmos. And Christians understood that this was inconsistent with the Jewish doctrine of creation out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And so they began to devise various philosophical arguments against the infinitude of the past. Uh, and this then was uh, developed uh, during the Middle Ages by medieval Islamic and Jewish philosophers, uh, and then bequeathed back to uh, Western Latin-speaking uh, theologians during the Middle Ages. So it has a long history, and one of the great things about the argument is its intersectarian appeal. It's been propounded by Muslims, mm -hmm, Jews, mm -hmm. Christians, both Catholic and Protestant, and so has a great interconfessional appeal. Now, what is the distinction between the cosmological argument and the Kalam cosmological uh, argument? Now, I was speaking of the Kalam all right, all right. cosmological mm -hmm. argument because that's the one I've specialized mm -hmm, in. Mm -hmm. But the cosmological argument more broadly would simply seek a ground for the existence of the universe, a, a sufficient reason why something exists rather than nothing. Mm -hmm. And that kind of cosmological argument is consistent with Aristotle's doctrine of the eternity of the universe. The universe is co-eternal with God, but nevertheless it depends upon him mm -hmm. for its order and its being. So that would be a broader cosmological mm -hmm. argument, which is, I, I think is also persuasive and defensible. But the one I was speaking of was this version that is based upon the finitude of the past. And what is the best argument in your view, say from philosophy, that the past is finite, that there's not an infinite number of days yeah. before today? Well, I think it would probably be the impossibility of forming an actually infinite collection of past events by going through them one at a time one after another. It's very difficult to see mm -hmm. how an infinite past could have been formed uh, by adding one member at a time to arrive at an actual uh, infinity of events today. And how about from the scientific perspective? You mm. specialized in this, Bill. In fact, uh, for those folks out there who don't know, the book Reasonable Faith, or Reasonable Faith is a book you need to get on this. And then you need to check out Dr. Craig's uh, website, reasonablefaith.org, because you're up to about question 800 or so, I think. I am. I wrote and, 813 this <laughs> week. <laughs> and that's right. So many of these questions are about this argument, and of course, many others. Sure. So with regard to uh, the scientific evidence, yeah. what do you think is the best evidence? Well, it's really hard to weigh the difference mm -hmm. between the evidence based upon the expansion of the universe, mm -hmm. which points to its origin at some time in the finite past, and the thermodynamic properties of the universe as a whole, which also implies the finitude of the past. And I, I'm not sure which one is mm -hmm. stronger. They're both very compelling. Uh, pieces of evidence. Now, I, we've heard uh, in the social media world that the James Webb Space Telescope oh. has somehow uh, gone against the Big Bang, the, mm -hmm. the fact that there was a beginning. That's not so, is it? No, that's just popular mm -hmm. misrepresentation mm -hmm. that you find in the sensationalist press. Um, what the James Webb Telescope suggests is that our theory of galaxy formation probably needs to be revised so that um, stars can be older than anticipated prior to that. But that's much, much later than the Big Bang itself, and it doesn't do anything to undermine the notion that the universe is expanding and had an origin at some time in the finite past. In fact, when you chase down the quotation that is usually repeated in the popular press to the uh, woman astronomer 
who said that it shook her faith in the Big Bang. Mm -hmm, she mm -hmm. denies ever having said that. Oh, she really? She says this was mis reported by the press, uh, and that that's not at all accurate. Now, Bill, as you've pointed out, and borrowing from your insight on this, when I go to a college campus, we go through the evidence that the universe mm -hmm. had a beginning, and I'll say, following you, that if space, time, and matter had a beginning, the cause, it seems, must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, and intelligent. Now, the only pushback I ever get, Bill, is this. Well, we just don't know what caused the universe. Oh. How would you respond to that? Well, I would say that if you agree that there had to be a cause, then the properties of that cause are very easy to deduce. Mm -hmm. uh, the properties that you just mentioned, it has to be a timeless, spaceless, immaterial, uh, eternal, um, enormously powerful, and I would argue personal, Mm. creator of the universe. Now, you don't need to call that God if you don't want to, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, the cause will have to have those properties unless the skeptic can refute the arguments that one gives mm -hmm. for those properties. They're not just asserted, there are arguments that mm -hmm. I give to support those properties of the first cause. So, so I think the argument is very rich in what it tells us about the nature of this first cause. So have you had people persist in trying to say, well, I'm just agnostic at the beginning. I don't think yeah. that it necessarily entails this spaceless, timeless, immaterial yes. cause. But on a different um, basis, Frank, Okay. what they would deny is that the causal principle can be applied to the universe as a whole and that therefore there doesn't need to be any oh, cause right. of the okay. universe. It's not that there mm -hmm. is one we don't know its nature, mm -hmm. it's that there doesn't need to be one. Mm. And I think that these people uh, tend to be very scientistic in their thinking rather than philosophical. And they think of the causal principle as a sort of physical mm. principle mm. akin to say, uh, the laws of ideal gases or the laws of thermodynamics that only apply in and to the universe, they don't understand that the causal principle is a metaphysical principle mm, mm. that applies to being as such, mm. and that therefore if the universe came into being, it's metaphysically impossible that being could arise from non-being. There has to be some sort of transcendent being that gives being to the universe and brings it into existence. So there's just a fundamental category mistake on the part of these folks in thinking of the causal principle as akin to a law of nature mm. rather than to a first principle of metaphysics. How would you defend the idea that causality is metaphysical and not just physical? Well, I give three arguments for the causal principle. The first is that it's based upon the fundamental metaphysical principle that something cannot come into being from nothing, mm -hmm. that being only comes from being. This is a principle as old as philosophy itself, goes all the way back to Parmenides, uh, and I think is eminently reasonable. Secondly, if you think that something can come into being uncaused from nothing, then it becomes inexplicable why anything and everything right. <laughs> doesn't come That's into right. being from nothing. There's nothing about nothingness that could mm -hmm. make universes be preferred mm -hmm. to everything else. Mm -hmm. And admitting that anything and everything can pop into being uncaused from nothing would destroy mm. the whole project of modern science. Yes. Because anytime you're confronted with a phenomenon to be explained, you could just say, well, it came into being from nothing, mm -hmm. uh, so that it would destroy modern science. Mm. And then the third one, would be a more inductive scientific argument, namely that when we look at things that begin to exist, we find they inevitably have causes. So it would be a good inductive inference from our sample class of things that begin to exist to infer that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Now that's not a metaphysical mm -hmm. grounding like the first two are, mm -hmm. but it would be an inductive um, empirical argument uh, to confirm those metaphysical arguments. Is it possible, I know that Lawrence Krauss, whom you've 
had mm -hmm. interactions with, he says in his book that every cause must be a material cause, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, if that's the case, wouldn't his own thinking be suspect? Because if every thought he has is completely oh. the result of the laws <laughs> of physics, why should he believe his thoughts are true? That gets into the broader question mm -hmm. of mind-body dualism. Mm -hmm. And I think you're quite right. If um, every cause is a physical cause, then even your thoughts are simply physically determined mm. by prior brain states, mm. and your rational thinking and deliberation has no effect whatsoever um, upon future brain states. And so it really does tend to be very self-defeating to affirm this kind of naturalistic, materialist theory of mind. Bill, you've also debated Sean Carroll. Yes. Um, what is his position on the origin of the universe, and how would you respond to it? I think he would be agnostic about the second premise that the universe began to exist. Mm. I think he would say that there are viable models of the universe which are past eternal and beginningless, but he's hard pressed to come up with any of them. Mm. His own model, the Carol Chen model, doesn't do the trick. Mm. It has to involve uh, a reversal of the arrow of time at some point in the past, where the arrow of time flips over and runs in the opposite direction so that you have a kind of mirror universe prior to ours. But, but the difficulty with that is that mirror universe isn't temporally prior to ours because the arrow of time runs mm -hmm. in the opposite mm -hmm. direction. What you really have is two universes with a common origin rather than a past eternal universe. So Carol wants to hold out hope for a beginningless past eternal model, but so far he hasn't been able to come up with them, nor has anyone else. Can you help our audience with the difference between a model, like say mm -hmm. Carol is bringing, and evidence for a theory, because you can have a model that doesn't have any sort oh. of connection to reality, right? Oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. and a great example of that would be Roger Penrose's conformal cyclical cosmology. Mm -hmm. It's a mathematical model of the universe and its origin, but it's utterly <laughs> unconnected with physical evidence. Mm -hmm. Not only is there no physical evidence in support of it, but he actually has to use a kind of alien physics that isn't descriptive of our universe in order to make the model work. So it's, mm. it's a purely mathematical model that has no connection with the world in which we actually live. Does that have any relation to Hawking's imaginary numbers and all that? Or Yes, one might uh. also say the same about the Hartle-Hawking mm. uh, cosmological model, that it features things like imaginary time, which are physically unintelligible and make no sense on a physical level. Now, I think Hawking could escape that objection by saying, well, his model isn't meant to be interpreted realistically. It's just meant to be instrumental. It, it, it just gives a, a model for a universe with mm. a finite mm. past but it shouldn't be taken to be a literal description of reality. Um, he tends to be a kind of anti-realist mm. when it comes to science and scientific models. Mm. Now, um, the main objection now to the cosmological argument, if you're, say, in a debate or on a college campus, what would it be? Is there one? Well, I think it would probably be skepticism that we really know that the universe began to exist. They, they would say science is so uncertain. Uh, and <laughs> therefore, science is so yeah, uncertain. When, when yeah. it comes to evolutionary <laughs> right. theory, That's right. science, uh, it was won today, uh -huh. another uh -huh. victory in the battle uh -huh. between science and religion has been won. That's right. Uh, but then when it comes to cosmology, we hear all of these grave misgivings uh -huh. about the uncertainty of science and how tenuous and provisional it is, even though the empirical evidence in support of the expansion of the universe and the thermodynamic properties of the universe are very powerful. Um, but I think that most 
laymen and particularly most students don't know anything mm. about this. Mm. And so they have just a kind of native agnosticism or skepticism where they say, nobody knows, mm. and, and they don't care to look into it. Mm. They don't know anything about the evidence. Uh, and so it's just a kind of ignorant skepticism that really doesn't have much basis to it. Now, sort of a sister argument to the cosmological argument is the fine tuning of the yes. universe. Um, what would you say uh, are the main tenets of that? I know there's mm. the fine tuning of the initial conditions, and then there's fine tuning of the current conditions, or how would you put that, Bill? I would say that there are two elements in our description of nature that exhibit this sort of incredible fine tuning for intelligent life. One would be the constants of physics, like the gravitational constant mm -hmm. um, that appear in the laws of nature. And then the other thing would be these arbitrary physical quantities that are just put in as initial boundary conditions on which the laws of nature then operate. And if these constants and quantities are not exquisitely finely tuned in their values, um, then the universe would be life prohibiting instead of life permitting. And I have been amazed, Frank, in my recent study of the fine tuning argument and bringing myself up to date on the literature, at how favorably this argument is viewed today, even by atheists and agnostics. Mm they will frequently admit that of all the arguments, it is the fine-tuning argument that does provide credible evidence for the existence of a transcendent designer of the universe. Now, they'll quickly add that there might be countervailing evidence, say the problem of evil, okay. or something like mm -hmm. that, that will outbalance mm -hmm. the argument mm -hmm. from fine-tuning. But taken as an argument on its own merits, mm -hmm. They are, many of them, prepared to say, yes, this is strong confirmatory evidence that there is a designer of the universe. Is that what you would think that Dawkins and, say, Krauss were referring to when they said one could make a case for a deistic creator uh -huh. who created the universe, fine-tuned it, but has left it? Is, yes. that, is that what they're looking at? That would fit in with right. that attitude, right. wouldn't okay. it? Uh, although even that would be a huge concession. Of course. To yeah. say there's a cosmic creator and mm. designer of the universe mm -hmm. who may, mm -hmm. for all we know, mm -hmm. also have revealed himself in human history, mm -hmm. depending on what the evidence says about that. Now, when you say the quantities, or were you speaking yeah. of, say, when Hawking says if the expansion rate of the universe was different by a thousand million million a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back in itself or never developed galaxies? Is that a quantity there? Yes, that would, that would be a, a quantity, All right. um, particularly related, say, to the density of the universe. Mm -hmm. These are arbitrary mm -hmm. numbers, contingent numbers, mm -hmm. or the ratio between the proton and the neutron, okay. the mass ratio, right. or the balance of matter over antimatter in the early universe. These aren't constants, but they are initial conditions okay. uh, on which then the laws of nature operate to produce the universe that we see today. And the, the biggest counter to this is apparently the multiverse. Yes, that's right. right. So, yes. so how would you respond to that? Well, I think that Roger Penrose has provided a devastating argument uh, against using the multiverse hmm. to explain fine-tuning, and that is to cut to the chase that not every observable universe is fine-tuned. You don't need to be fine-tuned to have observers hmm. in the universe. Hmm. You can have freak observers, uh, often called Boltzmann brains, which are just brains that fluctuate into being out of the quantum vacuum with illusory perceptions of the external world. Like they're in the matrix or them. something? Exactly, <laughs> okay. exactly. Right. And the fact is that if there is a multiverse, then we have no way to know whether or not we are ordinary, good, respectable mm -hmm. observers mm -hmm. as we think, mm -hmm. or whether or not we're Boltzmann brains with mm -hmm. illusions of an external world around us. And there's no way to disprove that we are these freak observers. And so the multiverse hypothesis leads immediately to utter skepticism about all of our sensory perception 
of the external world. And this is a real crisis for those who would want to use the multiverse to explain away fine tuning. Well, what evidence could there be for a multiverse, Bill? Can we witness any of these other universes or? No, not directly. Okay. The best hope would be that there would be some sort of indication in our universe that it has somehow causally interacted with one of these other universes. Right. Um, but these are very tenuous and speculative. This tends to be metaphysics rather than physics, I think, Frank. Right. But you see, as a metaphysician, uh -huh. I think I need to take them seriously. I, I don't think I can just dismiss them saying, well, these are unverifiable, unscientific conjectures. Mm -hmm. Because after all, theism mm. is also, I think, a metaphysical Sure. Yeah. Hypothesis. Yes. And so you have a naturalistic metaphysical hypothesis versus a supernaturalistic mm -hmm. metaphysical hypothesis. And I think that it, um, as such, they're, they are on a par and need to be weighed by which one provides the better explanation. And as I say, the naturalistic multiverse metaphysical mm -hmm. hypothesis leads to utter skepticism about our sensory knowledge of the external world and therefore is a disaster. Mm -hmm. Last thing I want to ask you, Bill, because you have to go. We happen to be here at in Denver at the Evangelical Theological Society. You can see the 2,000 seats behind us because there's going to be a big conference here shortly. Mm. Uh, but Bill, the origin of the laws of nature themselves. Mm. Um, I know that a number of years ago, Paul Davies had an article in the New York Times where he, he I think the title was something like Taking Science on Faith, where huh. he, he said, uh, Christians will say, well, the ground of all being is God. And atheists will say the ground of all being are these natural laws. And yeah. Davies asked the question of his colleagues, well, what's the origin of the natural laws? And and they were just full of consternation. Don't even ask that question. Yeah. That's not a scientific question. Yeah. Do you have any comment on that? I do, Frank. Yeah. <laughs> that leads to a third argument on which I've worked lately mm -hmm. uh, based upon Eugene Wigner's famous puzzle mm. of why mathematics is applicable mm. to the physical phenomena. Mm. What you call the laws of nature are really mathematical equations of tremendous elegance that describe the physical phenomena. Mm. And no one knows, apart from theism, why nature and these physical phenomena would conform mm -hmm. to these mathematical equations when, it, when mathematics has no causal influence upon the world. Right. If mathematical objects exist, they're just abstract, causally a feat mm -hmm. objects beyond space and time that have no causal impact upon the world. So why is it that the universe, that the physical phenomena are describable by mm -hmm. these elegant mathematical laws of nature? Wigner concluded that there is no natural explanation of this. He says, it is a miracle which we neither deserve nor understand. Mm -hmm. Now, I think he was more right than he knew when he said that I think it literally is a miracle that is to say, it is to be attributed to a transcendent, supernatural creator who had a mathematical model in mind on which he built the physical universe. Mm, mm. And then he put into those mathematical mm -hmm. equations the constants and quantities that would make intelligent life possible. So you've got this dual argument, hand in glove, from the applicability of mathematics and then the fine tuning of nature's constants and quantities. Didn't Hawking ask the question, who breathes fire into the equation? Famous question that mm -hmm. he asked, and that mm -hmm. is Wigner's question. Mm. Uh, why do these mathematical equations describe the universe? when they have no causal influence mm -hmm. upon the universe. Mm -hmm. That is Hawking's question. It's interesting, Bill. Yesterday I was talking to Stephen Meyer, and he said mm. there's a scholar, I can't remember where he's from, but he's just written an article in David Berlinski's Inference Journal where he's taking Wigner's uh, oh. question another step to where you're going. Wow. That God is behind the mathematical structure of the universe. Well, I'd like to see that because I've studied the literature, mm -hmm. brought it up to date recently, and although this argument is much discussed, very few uh, are willing to attribute 
the applicability of mathematics to divine mm -hmm. design mm -hmm. and creation. This mm -hmm. is a, a step that secular thinkers are not willing to make. Mm -hmm. So they wrestle with the problem, but they are not willing to take literally Wigner's answer that this is a miracle. Mm -hmm.